Gravity Falls is my favorite show, if you couldn't tell. It isn't the best show, but by God, is it my favorite. I've been a fan for years, going back about as early as when Land Before Swine aired, which was wildly 2013, about nine years ago. In that time, I've accrued Gravity Falls hats, Gravity Falls books, a Gravity Falls tattoo. And in that time, I've also formed a lot of friendships around this show. I met one of my partners through fandom. I've taken two cross-country road trips, one to Confusion Hill and another to the Mothman Festival in West Virginia, partly because of my love of this show. And everyone I've met and bonded with throughout all this, they were all other LGBTQ people. I also have distinct memories of finding groups of other Gravity Falls fans, absolute strangers at conventions, and talking with them when we all realize, wait, are we all queer in one way or another? It's become clear since then that Gravity Falls is a show that casts a surprisingly wide net as far as its fandom goes. It isn't the most diverse cast of characters, but the stories it seems to tell are somewhat universally loved. Which is also surprising considering the story it tells contains an interdimensional portal, an evil space demon, and whatever this is. Regardless, among fans, and especially among the circles of fandom I've interacted with on Reddit, Tumblr, Twitter, a huge chunk of them are part of the queer community. So clearly, something about it must mesh well with us. Now I know I'll get someone in the comments saying, if anyone watches this video, Hey, I like Gravity Falls, and I'm great. To which I'd say, congratulations. I'm very happy for you. Live your truth. Love is love. I'm so glad the fandom is diverse. I'm sure there's, you know, a couple of you loitering around, but we know why most people like Gravity Falls. It's a pretty good show. I mean, it's fine, I guess. But why do so many LGBTQ plus people in the audience seem to relate to Gravity Falls? Is it just because the experiences on the show are universal? Is it because of the gay cops? It's because of the gay cops, isn't it? I believe it's because the show contains depictions of a lot of experiences that particularly feel relatable and tuned in to what queer people have lived through, even if the writers never tried to do that, which I don't know if they did. It contains queer coding. We need to take a minute and discuss the difference between queer coding and queer baiting. Both of these terms are thrown around from time to time in queer readings of a text. In this case, the text is the entirety of Gravity Falls and the companion books. Queer baiting is when showrunners intentionally hint at a gay representation in popular characters, usually implying that a gay ship will get together specifically to keep viewers, and LGBTQ viewers mostly, invested in the narrative in hopes that it will be confirmed one way or another. Queer coding, however, can be intentional or unintentional. For the purposes of this video, I'm defining queer coding as narrative tropes, behaviors, and character designs that invoke queerness. Either because these tropes were previously or historically used in different shows and movies, etc. to establish a shorthand that audiences are now poised to recognize, or because of parallels to be found between the queer experiences that we've lived through and the experiences of a character. Coding is not indicative of queerness meant in a text. No amount of coding means that a character is canonically meant to be gay or trans, at least not usually. But when multiple instances of coding manifest in the same character, intentionally or otherwise, queer audiences tend to recognize it. Writers don't always set out to write queer characters, as we know. Even if LGBTQ people can see qualities of gay media representation in these guys, I don't know if Disney really intended for, I don't know, gay uncle Scar to be a gay uncle. So when me and my gay friends go, oh Scar, he's gay. That's on our reading of the character and the text based on social signifiers that have historically communicated queerness in media made by cishet makers. I don't think Gravity Falls falls into the category of queer baiting, but I do know that leagues of queer fans resonate with it. This video is simply an exercise in understanding why. Why do queer headcanon surround certain characters? Why do LGBTQIA fans gravitate to certain characters and plot points? And what is the nature of gay, aromantic, asexual, transgender coding, what have you, whether it's intentional or otherwise. This is how we're going to do this. First, we're going to look at canonically queer characters and elements of queerness in the text. Stuff that you know if you only watch the show and have never seen a Twitter post by the showrunners in your life. Then, we're going to look at characters who are queer or seem to be queer based on word of god implications, Twitter posts, AMA posts, 
charity streams, commentary, what have you. As in, queer representation that was intended or hinted at or supported through these external texts, but never confirmed in the show itself. It's the Hadith of Gravity Falls. And then, we're tackling the tough ones. There are characters in Gravity Falls that the audience, and particularly queer audience members, have latched onto and headcanoned in mass as part of the LGBTQ plus community, even though neither Alex Hirsch nor any of the other showrunners have implied it. This is not to say that every single gay person who watches the show thinks this. This is not based on straight people assigning labels to characters based on traits they stereotype as gay. And we are not assigning labels based on ships. But for one reason or another, many Gravity Falls fans who are queer feel seen in the experiences of characters who are never implied, either in the text or the commentary or the interviews, to be queer. And this is a video taking a look at why. Please don't take a shot every time I say queer. It's my first YouTube essay and I'm not trying to kill anyone. I ain't liable. So, some rules for this video. Number one, no assumptions of intention on behalf of the creators. As in, this video is a queer analysis utilizing queer theory and the lens of LGBTQIA plus experiences to take a deep dive into the character and narrative choices of the show. I'm not going to assume that any writer deliberately meant the show to be a queer text or an exclusively heteronormative text, unless stated by the showrunner or in the text itself. Number two. This isn't an everyone in Gravity Falls is gay and trans video, but it definitely is not a combination of that perspective or running on the assumption that everyone is straight. The canonical orientation of these funky little cartoon men is moot to the point. Canon orientation and gender is not what coding is about. Lastly, this show was started over a decade ago. To a lot of us, it might not seem like very long ago. In fact, objectively, it wasn't. But it is necessary to point out. After all, the national conversation on gender and race and sexuality has changed a lot in the last 10 years. There are things about Gravity Falls that have not aged well. I am not making this video to criticize all those things, but I'll likely mention them as we come across them if they have to do with the conversation at hand. My love of this show does not absolve it of any wrongdoing, but the show's wrongdoings don't mean that we can't critically enjoy and analyze the show. We can do all these things. I can chew gum and walk at the same time. Gravity Falls is my favorite show, but it isn't a perfect show. Hell, I think Alex Hirsch would agree with that second point. Now, without further ado... Here is an overly long video essay applying queer theory to a children's cartoon from So, spoiler alert for the entirety of Gravity Falls. The show, the books, everything. Also, a heads up right now that this is a video written for an adult audience, not for children. It's a dense theory video touching on sexuality, homophobia, transphobia, queer coding in Hollywood, and later on, themes of abuse, racism in Hollywood, and also, whatever jokes I feel like putting in here. I'm a grown man. We're keeping it snappy because I'm sure some of you are like me and have rewatched the show every year since it's ended, and some of you are, what's the word? Ah, yes, well adjusted people who haven't felt the need to rewatch the show again and again and again since 2016. Dipper and Mabel are two twins who get sent up to Oregon by their parents to live with their great uncle Stan for the summer. Dipper because he's too much of a pro gamer and he must be punished for his sins, and Mabel because she's strangling the family cat. Upon arriving, Dipper finds a mysterious journal full of scientific research on supernatural entities in the woods. And he and Mabel realize the town is not just a dingy roadside town in the middle of the woods with nothing to do, but a dingy roadside town in the middle of the woods with nothing to do with cryptids and a cult. The mystery shack, the tourist trap that Stan owns, makes its money off of attractions based on the paranormal. Though Stan himself insists that there's nothing paranormal or supernatural about these woods at all. At least until season two. Kid I've always known. In town, the kids meet Lil Gideon, an evil child psychic, Wendy, the coolest girl in town that Dipper has an unrequited crush on, and Pacifica, Dipper's rich rebound crush who lives in a haunted mansion. 
and Old Man McGucket. <laughs> the funny comic relief Appalachian homeless man, who I'm sure has nothing to do with the plot of the story, and who I'm sure we won't need to touch on again. Who else? Ah yes, Bill Cipher, the eldritch triangular dream demon who possesses people. Summer fun! Season 2 mostly focuses on the mystery. Who wrote Journal 3? Was it Manly Dan the Lumberjack? Was it the goat? Was it Stan with some sideburns glued on? Was it Old Man McGucket? <laughs> Nah, that seems unlikely. Well, anyways, eventually it's revealed that Stan has a secret interdimensional portal hidden in the basement of the Mystery Shack. And for the last 30 years, he's been tinkering with it to bring back his long-lost twin brother, who he accidentally pushed through in 1982-ish. The timeline isn't very clear in this show. It doesn't go great when Stan brings him back. Brother! That's partly because the two haven't been on good terms since the 1960s, when Stan accidentally wrecked Ford's science project and ruined his chances at a great college. Stan was then kicked out of home, and they never reconnected because, as we all know, therapy wasn't invented until 2016, and these two men were too emotionally constipated to talk to each other. That's gonna be a running theme. While Stan was homeless, Ford was in his backup college, where he had to work twice as hard, but eventually ended up researching in Gravity Falls where he met Bill and was tricked into making the portal with the help of his old college buddy Philford Hadron McGucket, the engineering genius who, after falling through the portal, wiped his memory of the whole thing because he has anxiety. Which, I mean, mood, but couldn't he just go to, oh yeah, therapy wasn't invented yet. Yeah. While Philford was erasing his entire being, Ford called Stan for help. Ah, yes. So we're back in 2012-ish. The timeline isn't very clear. <clears throat> 2013. And the boys are fighting. But even more pressing, Stan bringing Ford back causes an interdimensional rift, and if Phil gets his hands on it, we'll have an apocalypse. Oh wait, it's fine. They got some unicorn hair in season 2 episode 15, and the shack is protected, so they're safe as long as they stay home. The next episode is a road trip episode when most of the family leaves home. Nothing happens to the rift, it's fine. At least until next week. The apocalypse ensues, the family is separated until they're not, Stan sacrifices himself to destroy Bill, kinda, and then the family gets Stan's memory back through the power of love and the power of Mabel. And at the end of summer, Dipper and Mabel go home. So then, let's do it. Let's talk about the two canon queer characters in the show. Oh, you don't remember me mentioning them during the summary of important characters and events? Hmm, I wonder why. I think this is as good a place to say that this is the portion of the video where I'm probably hardest on Gravity Falls, but before we talk about any of these guys, we gotta jump into this and analyze the representation that the show does have to offer. Gloves and Durin are a character relief duo who, from the very beginning of the show, are framed as overly affectionate, at least for what you'd expect from two male cops. And that's part of the joke. Where most sheriffs are mean to their deputies, the showrunners wanted to frame these two as affectionate. Ring, 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 ring! <laughs> <laughs> he sure loves his bell. They call each other pet names. They put arms around each other. They call each other a treasure. Time we spend together is treasure enough. It's pretty clear, both from Disney standards and practices notes, that the two remain comedic in their affection, and from Alex Hirsch's own words in a DVD commentary, that he also, at the beginning, intended for them to just be a comedy relief duo of buddies, and not actually be a canon queer couple. This is reinforced by a Reddit AMA post in which he said that he didn't have any plans to put LGBT characters in, because he didn't think he'd be able to. A post from 2013. And then, in the finale, this was changed. Alex made it canon. My blobs! Don't you ever scare me like that again! <laughs> you know, if I had a nickel for every time the only queer canon character in a Disney animated property was an animated cop, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Now, it might be tempting to say that from the very beginning, the showrunners were doing their best to show a queer couple on the screen, and they just couldn't get away with it, so they had to depend on coding. After all, look at these looks. This body language? This is as coding as it gets. But. I don't think it's this simple. In a DVD commentary, this is what Alex has to say. Blubs and Durland were originally conceived as best friends, and then a lot of people saw them as more. And it felt like, well, if that's the feeling, then maybe that's the conclusion they deserve. 
And I remember speaking to one of my board artists because I felt like he had a valuable perspective on this thing. He seemed like someone who might be kind of close to this. Is he, you know, kind of close to this? Do you think it's more respectful or less respectful for them to have this moment? Is it too silly? His reply was, I think this feels true to them and it feels like they earned it. Which, I mean, I'm glad that he asked. I suppose it's better than what could happen when cishet people write our stories for us. But all this still makes me feel something. When I first listened to this commentary, it sounded a little bit like Alex was asking his gay friend, would this be bad representation? And then his gay friend, what well, Alex, my guy, they've been shooting doomy eyes at each other for two seasons. We might as well. It's not like we're getting canceled. Well, honestly, it sounds a little bit more like he's asking about this specific sequence. If you break the rules, we're gonna zap you. Zap, zap! We're mad with power! And love. About them grabbing each other's faces and looking into each other's eyes after threatening the townspeople with police violence. Summer fun! So is that too silly? I have no opinion on the matter either way. Because I honestly never cared that much about Bubs or Durland. I was never invested in their romance. But I am glad that they were confirmed as a couple instead of just letting MLM affection be a series-long running joke. Which, yeah, I'll be upfront and say that I don't think that the two notoriously stupid cops are the best representation of gay love. But at this point, what are we gonna do? Put in all this coding and not let them be gay? Harvey Milk didn't die for this, Alex. I don't doubt, though, that this was likely an uphill battle, at least going by the battles with SMP and the interviews that we're privy to. It looks like Disney executives were more than okay with the implications of queerness being just a funny joke, instead of committing to it as queer representation. And while Alex might have signed off at the joke at first... Have you lost weight? <laughs> Finally, someone noticed. He eventually committed himself to bringing something meaningful to the table. And meaningful is relative, but I still think this is significant for what it was. I want to give credit where it's due. It's hard to believe it now, but this kind of representation was not happening at the time in children's media. On a different note, this actually reminds me a lot of the treatment of Grenda and Grenda's evolution into a fully developed character. And oh boy, do we gotta talk about Grenda. I'm sorry guys, we gotta talk about Grenda. Mm. Oh, this is Grenda time! Mm. Alex has said in a stream, I believe, that Grenda is not supposed to be trans. And instead, she's a commentary on puberty and the awkwardness that happens to the body in the time. And I believe his description of his intentions here. I wasn't in a writer's room, obviously. I don't know what's in their hearts. But the way they wrote Grenda doesn't quite seem mean-spirited enough for me to assume ill intent. After all, Grenda's a fucking delight if you ask me. I love her confidence, and I love how her character develops as the show goes on. But they do this joke- I used to sing like that! Before my voice changed- Her voice changing into a more masculine one. Something traditionally thought of as associated with masculine puberty. By the way, you sound like a professional wrestler. <laughs> I want to put her in a headlock and make her feel pain! It's one of those things that, regardless of the writer's intentions, the joke seems rooted in transphobic sentiment. This kind of stuff long predates Gravity Falls. A million shows and movies and comics have made bits on the perceived dissonance between gender identity and gender expression. You know, ha ha, man in dress, man not wear dress, man wear pants. Isn't this zany? Putting male characters in dresses and makeup. Because it's funny. Giving female characters muscles and a deep voice. Because it's funny. But we can't ignore an implication or centuries-old transphobic sentiment because of what their intentions might be. People that watch the show aren't in the writer's room to hear those intentions. And lots of trans people feel lots of things about Grenda, both positive and negative. Hell, lots of cis people feel things about Grenda. I have transphobic relatives who watch the show with me and laughed at it, thinking it was intended to be a transphobic joke. And that's indicative of something. I want to note here that there are definitely trans viewers who saw themselves in Grenda in a positive way, and I don't want to invalidate that. I am bothered by the use of an old trope that has transphobic origins, but Grenda is a great character and lots of fun. One part of the show where she really shines is the Northwest Mansion mystery. 
On the Mystery Shack Look Back, a podcast about Gravity Falls, on the episode about Northwest Mansion Mystery, one of the hosts, Ella Cesari, who is a trans woman, said that she saw significance in this sequence. Candy and Mabel try to police how feminine Brenda is, even trying to hide her away because they're embarrassed and they want to flirt with cute boys, and they assume that the boys won't be interested in Brenda. But Brenda is shown to be in the right to be herself. Brenda, was it? I must speak with you. There's something about you. I can't get you out of my head. You're so bold and confident. I know you're probably out of my league, but might I give you my phone number? I don't have a phone! Write it on my face! What you say? Mm, that you only meant well. And some trans viewers might feel seen by this sequence, but I don't think that removes the messiness of how Grenda was conceived as a character. Like, even if the writers didn't write Grenda to be trans, the comedy can still inadvertently play on transphobic sentiment. It's similar to how they gave Toby bodacious tea, a t-shirt that says sassy girl, before he insists on being called another name, which Wendy treats as ridiculous. Toby, you watch the camp. Don't call me Toby anymore. Call me bodacious tea. No one will ever call you that. Aww. And then they joke in the commentary that he's now living his truth. And yeah, we gotta talk about Toby too. I swear, I don't want to, but here we are. I don't think that the show writers are saying that Toby Determined is trans or non-binary. But this is something that feels, at least to me, to be apparent trans or non-binary coding. Not because it matches my experience or the experiences of non-binary people that I know, but because this is the way that trans and non-binary representation and jokes looked like in the early 2010s. I couldn't find much info in Journal 3 about what happened to Bodacious T after the events of Gravity Falls. But in the comics, there's a secret code that will lead you to the Shmebu Unlocked webpage on the Disney website. On this page, Shmebulock presents you with 10 books. The ninth book is a page of Gravity Falls funny pages, inspired by the characters. They're a classic, not that funny comics. It's a nice little gag. And we do have one comic about Toby Determined. So, yet again, the joke is that Toby Determined's gender expression is not masculine. <laughs> Isn't that zany? It's also worth noting that years of seeing trans people on screen depicted in a creepy way also lends itself to this. Bodacious T throughout his run of the series was creepy and invasive to Chandra Jimenez. And I don't think that the writer is meant to play with that, but it's a reading you can detect if you've seen or experience coded in such a way before. From people who do have transphobic intent. Problematic depictions of queerness can become part of a coding lexicon if we've seen them enough. And it can be hurtful. As far as queerness goes in the actual text of the show, there isn't much else outside of Blubs and Durland. Well, unless you count Detective being pregnant. Or if you include everything about Tyler Cupicker, including him jumping out of the Love Gods groupie van. And that one person in the Stanturian candidate who is probably an animation mistake? Heyo! Stan! Stan! Now just the ladies! Stan! Good for her. Okay, enough of all that. Let's get down to the fun stuff. So let's move on to stuff that's way more fun for me to talk about. Wendy Corduroy is the daughter of local lumberjack Manly Dan Corduroy and the only girl among her siblings. She works as a cashier at the Mystery Shack where Dipper, who is visiting the shack over the summer, catches a huge crush on her, probably because she's the coolest person in the show. Literally. By fate. Designated to be the coolest character. He maintains his crush even as she dates another guy, Robbie Valentine. <laughs> an enormous douche who is later shown to be, you know, like a lot of 15-year-olds just figuring himself out, but who she eventually breaks up with. After this, Dipper and her hang out until circumstances lead to him revealing his feelings. She turns him down, kindly, teaching him a valuable lesson about accepting the awkwardness of unrequited feelings and valuing friendship. So, does Wendy is gay? Let's take a look at what Alex Hirsch has to say. The first time he weighed in was in 2017. Someone said, I signed up for Twitter just to ask if Wendy is closeted lesbian or bisexual. 
is she? And he said, could be. <laughs> it still kills me. He's like, who's to say? It's your show, Alex. You're to say. I understand why he does this, though. He doesn't want anyone to, like, you know, be upset that their headcanon isn't true. I get it. It's fine. But then this asshat was in. She had, like, 106 boyfriends. Mm. And he says, and none of them worked out. So in 2017, when this tweet came out, I distinctly remember me and my friends having a talk about it. Like, this means she's a lesbian. After all, it seems from this that he might be indicating that none of the relationships worked out because she wasn't really into them. Possibly because she just hadn't figured out she was a lesbian yet, which is something somewhat relatable to a lot of people who end up finding out that they're lesbians later on in life. The second time he weighed in was in 2020. Someone asks, were there any planned LGBTQ plus characters or was the note too early in production to even be able to get to that point? Someone else responded, I'd root for Wendy being bi. I'd love that. And he says, it would be kind of surprising if she wasn't. Pine tree emoji. Now, I'm not too sure about the pine tree emoji. Is he indicating interest in Dipper or is, am I just, is it because she's a lumberjack? I feel like I'm missing something, but regardless, it feels like he's saying she's canonically bisexual, which I'm trying to consolidate with the earlier tweet. The wiki also takes this as him saying that she's bisexual. The point is, God says she's queer. The labels don't matter so much in this video, but they do a little bit here because they impact how we reframe a viewing, which we should probably address. For instance, if we take a look at Wendy's list of exes and her indifference to dating men through a lesbian lens, it makes a lot of sense. She doesn't have a lot of interest in them. Even at one point, just for getting to break up with one guy. Feldman, Mark Epstein. Oh man, I'm not sure I ever actually broke up with him. No wonder he keeps calling me. She seems to be dating because she figured, hmm, why not? Even her acceptance of Robbie's date has the same tone as her offer to hang out with her 12-year-old friend. But she did date Robbie and the rest of these guys. And saying that she only broke up because she's a lesbian when she did date them feels a little bit like we might be erasing a character's agency, which I don't want to do. It's a little bit like when David Bowie was like, I'm bisexual, and everyone was like, what do you mean by that? And he was like, it means I'm bisexual. But also, Comphet exists, which is a whole other can of worms. So, I'm not sure on this one. Ignoring the labels going forward, going with sapphic and queer. Something I do know is that historically in Hollywood films, going back to the 30s and 40s, one way for movies to get away with indicating queerness in women was to give the characters masculine roles, like, I don't know, a lumberjack, or even any roles of power and a lack of apparent interest in sentimentality or romance with men. A coolness, one might say. In the text, Wendy's chillness when it comes to guys looks like aloofness, probably to most people. With the addition of these tweets and the interpretation of Wendy as sapphic, however, or in some fan readings, asexual or aromantic, it transforms that aloofness and lack of overt romantic excitement into an element of queer upbringing. The disconnect to dating is something familiar, that straight audiences might not pick up on, but that queer audiences, and particularly sapphic or aromantic audiences, might, as we relate it to our own teenage circumstances and confusion. So, Wendy is often seen in this light, but not just because of the tweet saying so, a lot of sapphic people, myself included, recognized this before Alex confirmed it. We saw a bit of ourselves in Wendy's behaviors, in her lack of intense outward passion for Robbie, in her love of indie music and flannel. How do we know people recognize this? Well, the fact that someone asked to begin with. I know it's common for content creators to get questions about the LGBTQ plus status of their characters based around ships. And like, some people ship Wendy and Tamri, but I don't think that's where the speculation comes from. It comes from the recognition of traits that sapphic people see in themselves, and tropes that sapphic people have learned to recognize as intended shorthand for queerness in media. The cool girl who's confirmed to be bisexual. The lesbian who wears a lot of flannel. These are things that we've had to learn are shorthand for sapphic media representation, because up until recently, it was the only representation we got. And because queer options for representation are so limited, 
when looking for reflections of ourselves in media, audiences have had to become eagle-eyed. And speaking of eyes... So, you might be wondering, wait, Hannah, I thought this section was about characters who were confirmed through tweets and Reddit to be gay or trans. Alex never said anything about Bill going to Pride. Well, Bill Cipher was at Pride. I saw him there and he stole my teeth. That bitch. So, let's take a look at the Reddit post that I'm using to justify Bill in this section. Someone asks Bill what his gender is as you do, and he replies, My dimension has 14 billion genders! It's very confusing! I'm honestly not sure! It would take years of paperwork to sort it all out! Oh my god, we love a trans mask king! So, he's at least not cisgender, or rather, not a cis man or woman. Does that count as him being trans? Uh, I don't know, he never transes his gender. Does that make him intersex? I'm not sure about that either. But at the very least, he's not of the binary genders. He's not binary. He's trinary. There isn't a lot of gender-based coding of him within the show, unless we count him being an alien from outside of our dimension. There's a very long established and very tired trope of the only character in a series who's non-binary being an alien or a demon or a monster of some kind. We're not going to put that trope too closely under a magnifying glass in this video, so for more you can look at Rowan Ellis's Loki the Queer Alien Problem video. But the fact that it is an established trope in media means that audiences have seen it before, and they might be primed to find that interpretation here. I don't know if this counts as representation, and if it does, does it count as good representation? Um, thankfully that's not what this video is about. But Bill's evil actions, along with some of his more interesting interactions with Stanford Pines, actually call to mind another element of historical queer coding in media. Welcome to the Gay Villain Tangent Corner. I'm your host, a gay villain. In the 1930s, the Hayes Code was established by the U.S. government in congruence with conservative right-wing groups who were concerned about the state of the animation and film industry. They didn't want any kind of perversion, including gay representation, interracial marriages, or premarital sex to be shown to the public. Depictions of sin were left to villains, and if a character did sin, they had to be punished by the end of the movie. So you had a string of movies and animations in the 30s and 40s where evil acts were defined and informed by Christian interpretations of sin. And as such, film directors got creative with how interchangeable these things were, using queer traits to emphasize villainy, making evil characters seem strange and outlandish. Evil men had feminine traits and evil women had masculine ones. It was madness, I tell you! But these stereotypically queer traits, along with toxic traits like possessiveness and predatory behaviors, were used in tandem to make the characters seem more villainous in the eyes of the average nuclear family household. Now you won't catch me saying that just because Bill Cipher is a villain that he's coded as gay. Sometimes villains are straight. It's known to happen once every hundred years when the stars align. I'm not saying Bill is queer-coded because he's evil. No, no, no. I'm saying that Bill is queer-coded because he's a martini-sipping man in a fancy outfit who serenades Ford on a piano, ruffles his hair, and puts an arm around him after he calls him cute. It's interesting because this overfamiliarity and dapper dress is just what villains are depicted as nowadays. When you think of villains, you think of someone in a curly mustache and a top hat. You think of the larger-than-life personality. And you think of the over-affectionate behavior with the hero. The original coding of villainous behaviors and the implementation of queer characteristics to make villainous characters seem weird and unfamiliar has stuck well past the Hayes Code. You see it in effeminate Disney villains like Scar and Jafar. Hell, you really see it in Lil Gideon, and his cute little moisturizing, bedazzled self, yes you do. And to an extent, you see it in Bill. Is he, you know, a villain in a Disney property? And we don't hate these characteristics. Most of the time, queer audiences seem to find them somewhat fun. 
Look at the way Ursula is so revered in queer millennial circles. Bill teasing Ford, serenading him, taking him up to the penthouse suite, and then threatening him in the same breath. It's sinister. It's evil. And we're having a blast with it. Melanie Conan, assistant professor of rhetoric and media studies at Lewis and Clark College, said this in an insider video on queer coding and animation. Queer audiences may in fact embrace the villain over the hero because the villain offers an alternative vision of life that doesn't end in heterosexual romance. The writing team of Gravity Falls likely wasn't trying to make Bill come off as gay, but rather for him to come off as villainous using the visual shorthand that's been available to writers and audiences since the 1940s. In today's media landscape, those two things, queerness and villainy, have become aesthetically interchangeable. As Jessica kelgren Fozard said in her video on the history of queer coding, linked below, the current stereotypical means of presenting villainy are born from previous iterations of queerness on screen. As such, a lot of villain coding is just queer coding with an evil curly mustache. There are things about most villains, including Bill Cipher, that resonate with queer audiences. As Matt Baum said in his video on queer coding, linked below, villains want to overthrow the status quo, and heroes are the ones who want to maintain it. So to be a villain in a movie or TV show actually feels in some ways more congruent with the goals of the gay liberation movement. The major effort today is to change the social institutions that make life difficult for us. Upheaval of the status quo, a rejection of the laws of the land, especially when those laws make it impossible for you to live your life freely. You know, be gay, do crime. Speaking of which... Okay, it's time to talk about Stan. I'm gonna be honest, I'm not quite positive yet whether or not I'm putting Stanley in the section about characters who have some amount of external confirmation that they're queer, or the characters who don't really have anything going for them as far as evidence. Let's call this like a pocket dimension. You know, a dimension between dimensions? Like, this section can touch itself within this dimension and not dissipate into nothing. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. So, I've already summarized the show. You know his story. So let's begin with the tweet that has ruined my life since 2015. And by ruined, I mean I think about this every single day, every single time I look at Stanley Pines. Somebody brings up the idea that maybe Stan, in all of his old manliness, might be a homophobe. And Alex Hirsch responds, nah nah, Stan would actually be cool with gay marriage. Don't forget what happened in Vegas. You might be wondering, what happened in Vegas, Hannah? Well, you see. At the end of the episode where Seuss and the kids fight a video game yandere anime girl, Stan fucks off to Las Vegas with old Goldie, the metallic old prospector animatronic statue, a penny press that bleeds oil from its eyes, and they get married. Love wins. What am I looking at here? Ugh. You know, the best part is that he got married using Ford's name. I guess Stanford Pines is gay and I got the marriage license to prove it. Pack it up, boys. Oh, we'll get to you, Pines. So, we have this tweet. So, like... Did Stan fuck the statue? Does this count as confirmation of Stanley being bisexual or pansexual? Am I being dismissive by not being sure? Do I not truly think love is love? <laughs> My fellow Americans, is love losing? Am I doing the thing again where the text is saying, look at this man, he's clearly bisexual or pansexual. Look at him, happily carrying his new metallic husband over the threshold. Am I ignoring it just because it's with an animatronic prospector? Is this David Bowie all over again? Sound off in the comments if you think I'm a bifo. Wink. And I'd be ready to dismiss this as a bit if it wasn't a bit that Alex Hirsch has made, like, multiple times. More external confirmation would be the Stanchez drawings that he's done during streams. Now, on one hand, he's always very quick to point out that drawings during streams are not 
canon. On the other hand, you know, Sanchez duets and drawings featuring Rick Sanchez and Stanley Pines in a romantic context. I got you to kiss goodnight. Oh, I got you to hold me tight. They're kind of a running theme during these streams. How many times would Alex make this joke if he didn't mean it? It's like a frat boy giving a blowy to his roommate. It could only be a joke so many times. Yes, even if you say no homo. So I'm not sure whether to call all this direct word of God confirmation or not. But you know what? If you're asking me, fuck it. He's bisexual, but I'm not in charge. Regardless of what I say, and also regardless of whether or not it's intentional and canon that Stanley Pines is bisexual, the external information contributes to the interpretation we can already find in the show. Because even ignoring everything that Alex Hirsch has said outside on social media, Outside of a Gravity Falls script, there is plenty of coding that feels relatable to queer audiences. If we're going chronologically in Stan's life, we can begin with Stan as a kid, being bullied at school. His dad begins pushing him to be tougher, to start boxing, to be more manly, at least under societal standards. This is a relatable concept to any queer person who's raised and socialized as male. When you live in an environment like, say, the lead paint district of a crummy New Jersey town in 1960-something, a setting that likely upholds the idea that queerness is not compatible with manliness, you feel the pressure to toughen up. And if you ask me, I'd say that plenty of queer people have trouble with bullying. So there you have it. Stan was kind of seen as a loser. He really didn't have a support network outside of Ford. And Stan was rejected and thrown out by his family around the time he was 17, living out the rest of his time as a teenager on the streets. I feel like I don't need to explain this one. Being thrown out is basically in the LGBTQ plus youth representation and media stutter kit. I can't believe it's not queer. Something else of note is that Stan seems to crave family approval. I mean, later on, we see this in him craving approval from his brother in the form of getting him back from the nightmare realm, but he also seems to crave it from his dad through his goal of getting millions and coming home having made something of himself. The internal motivations of doing what you can to be accepted by your family is one that a lot of queer audience members likely sympathize with. Hell, especially closeted members. I myself am still not out to most of my family, even as an adult. And I moved out and married. I'm not worried about them finding this video. They won't watch it. Most of them don't care about Gravity Falls. Apparently, it's a dumb show for children. Well, they're right. But it's my dumb show for children. So, money and financial success is the metric that Stan measures success with. And he ties it up with not being rejected with being part of his family. So there might actually be something to the fact that Stan takes over the identity of his twin brother Stanford after accidentally pushing him through the portal. Ford, through Stan's eyes, the better twin, was never rejected by his family, at least not in an obvious way, and has made some amount of money through his college grant. Though I'm not sure how much of this money was available for general use outside of his studying. But still, money was Stan's metric for gauging success. So when Stan takes on Ford's name, Ford's identity, as the grunkle that the younger twin's parents wouldn't mind sending their kids up to, as someone who has a name for himself, this can feel interesting through a queer lens. In a way, one might say that Stan is using his brother's identity and his own perception of Ford's success to pass as a success. Even ignoring his backstory, there is some coding to be found in Stan's run of the series at large. He openly recognizes attractiveness in men. He calls Kraz and Zyler beautiful and radical men in his dreams. He calls a member of several times a beautiful man rummaging through his trash. And a man calling another man beautiful isn't inherently gay, but it is surprising from a 60-something-year-old man from New Jersey, especially a hardened criminal like Stan. So aside from a life of crime, there's also something interesting about Stan's life that's noted in Mabel and Dipper's Guide to Mr. And non-stop fun. 
Buckle up, guys. So there's this throwaway line in the book about Stan seeing a Rorschach test during his loony days, probably in the late 60s and early 70s, which is when he was homeless. But what someone might not know is that during the 60s and a little bit later than that, inkblot tests were sometimes used to identify homosexuality. And it was still deeply pathologized at the time. And... I don't think that Alex Hirsch thought that deeply about it. It's definitely a stretch, but it's a stretch that a queer audience member with knowledge of the queer liberation movement and the history of pathologizing queerness might find in the text. It's a stretch that I latched onto when I first read this years ago. <sighs> Maybe it's a stretch, but we can find stilts on Amazon with prime shipping. Let's go! <laughs> Also from this time of Stan's life, meaning the time when Stan was likely homeless and before he went to Oregon to help Ford, Stan probably would have met Jimmy Snakes. So Jimmy Snakes is not a canon character. It doesn't seem like he was used in the show in any meaningful capacity. Um, Jimmy Snakes is Stan's old biker pal who visits Gravity Falls. And in the sketch, Stan is dressed in what looks like, <laughs> I don't even know what to call this, a domestic way. He's wearing an apron. He seems to have just baked Jimmy a loaf of bread and Jimmy is spitting on him. I guess you can assume why when the fandom saw this photo, they kind of imagined Jimmy as Stan's old abusive ex-boyfriend. Something else of note is that in the episode Scaryoki, the first episode of season two, when Dipper goes into Stan's room, we actually see a flash of an old biker jacket and a helmet. So... I don't know how canon Jimmy Snakes is, but it is interesting that any remnant of him is, you know, in the closet. You'll notice that this entire time, I've specified Stan as being read as bisexual or pansexual. But labels don't really matter when we're talking about queer coding. After all, in the eyes of the cishet content creators that established this coding decades ago, they didn't really care to specify which labels they were utilizing. Queer was queer. The reason I've chosen these labels for the purposes of this video is that going by a literal viewing of the show, Stan is definitely seemingly interested in women. As a kid, we see him peeping. As a teenager, as a grown man, he talks about babes. He has pinups of girls on his calendar. He fantasizes about women wanting him. He likes women. Though I guess... None of his romantic endeavors with women ever worked out. And he does say that marriage is terrible. And he does run away from his date with Lazy Susan. And I guess there is a difference between wanting women to like him and liking women. But he does subscribe to Fully Clothed Women magazine. But I guess the women are fully clothed. You know, with how much Stan talks about liking women, it actually kind of reminds me of when I was like a teenager and I would lean into being super boy crazy. Like I pretended to have a crush on Orlando Bloom. Like I'm bisexual, I'm attracted to men as well, but I was leaning into heterosexuality hard just because it felt like what I was supposed to do. Internalized homophobia is a bitch. <laughs> Internalized biphobia is too. <laughs> It's hard to tell if Alex's Goldie tweet is confirmation of anything meaningful, or if it's just a bit. After all, he used to joke about Jordi LaForge being the author of the journals. I don't know how much we can count his Twitter account as canon. When it comes to queer headcanons, though, these actually aren't the characters that are most brought up, at least from what I've seen in my time in the fandom, and according to a survey that I'll talk about a bit later. The time has come to talk about the characters who, going by the show's text, the commentary, and all of the interviews available to me, are in no way implied to be part of the LGBTQ plus community. And yet, they have a massive group of fans decoding them as such. Come on boys, let's break out those stilts. <laughs> so. Let's talk about Pacifica. Pacifica Northwest is the only child of Priscilla and Preston Northwest, wealthy parents. Her father owns a mudflap company as well as most of the town, and Priscilla was a beauty queen. 
Pacifica is, during the course of the show, shown to be snobby, a one-dimensional mean girl, a bully character, kind of like the blonde from Lizzie McGuire. She's the rich girl who enjoys making everyone miserable. As you've already forgotten, Pacifica Northwest is the worst. And that's not just jealousy talking, I'd say that to her face. I need your help. You're the worst. In the Alex Hirsch AMA between seasons one and season two, he had this to say. Pacifica's terrible, guys. She was invented to be the literal diametric opposite of Mabel. Anything you see about her is a projection you've invented. Ha ha. I mean, say what you want about Alex, but he just says it. Gotta appreciate that on some level. So in between season one and season two, a ship started to kind of form between Mabel and Pacifica. Mabe Pacifica. I'm gonna be upfront and say that I never really understood Mabe Pacifica, especially when the show was doing so much to push Dipper and Pacifica together in the show and in the comics, and especially not when there were so many other characters in my head that had much heavier queer coding. Oh, we'll get to you, Pines. But even so, as the show went on, and as I talked to more fans who shipped it, I began to really understand what they were getting at. Pacifica is an interesting case. She got some development in season two. They set her up as someone who is under the boot of her parents, someone who is expected by her mom and dad to be beautiful and rich and successful in everything that she does. There is no room for failure in any of these regards. Oh, and whatever happens, just remember one thing. You're a Northwest. Don't lose. When I called Pacifica Dipper's rebound crush, I wasn't kidding. It has all the hallmarks. Awkward hugs and blushes and denial of interest. It's very cartoon for kids of them. But like I said, while the show was running, there was way more interest in the ship between Pacifica and Mabel. More so than between Pacifica and Dipper. Which is even odder considering that all we've ever really seen of her and Mabel was her mocking Mabel. Though I guess that is how things started with Dipper as well, huh? You know, as I think about it more, I don't think it's completely out of left field to ship her with Mabel. After all, Mabel straight up has the bisexual flag on the coloring book. God, that fucking coloring book. Is that confirmation? Is it not confirmation? Is it just someone at Disney liking shades of pink and purple and blue? Surely not, it's the whole ass bisexual flag. This isn't like when someone throws in a sunset in a show and someone on Tumblr goes, Look, they sampled the lesbian flags. It has pinks and purples and oranges. No, this is a whole ass bisexual flag. Hell, her whole aesthetic is covered in rainbows. The problem is, I've been burned before. You spend an entire lifetime starved for representation, and then you have representation dangled in front of you and then ripped away, and it gets hard to accept the crumbs that you do get. <sighs> is this bisexual flag a crumb? Am I at the point where I'm staring at a bisexual flag and going, I don't know if this is a bi flag as much as it is shades of magenta and violet and navy blue and horizontal stripes. <sighs> This is madness! <laughs> I've also seen it said that Mabel might be a lesbian with a bad case of Compet. And if we're talking about Pacifica, we gotta define Compet officially. Compet, or compulsory heterosexuality, is a term used to describe the effects of the pressure and expectation placed on everyone, but in this case, lesbians specifically, to fit into the heteronormative role. The term isn't perfect, and I'm being way too brief here to include all the nuances, but you can check out the Compat Master document linked below. It's a source for lesbians and a very extensive analysis of what this theory entails, and it just has a bunch more info in general. But to be way too reductive, compet is the pressure by society that convinces women that they cannot be happy unless they have a husband or a boyfriend, and that success for women looks the way that patriarchal society encourages women to be. Monogamous, 
beautiful, feminine, marriage babies. And these pressures often make it difficult for lesbians to discover who they are. A lesbian who is experiencing compet might experience intense pressure to fit in with feminine expectations of their parents. Or they might be in a committed relationship with a man, but nothing feels quite right, like they don't have that spark. Hell, they might be in a relationship with a man, not because they're attracted to him, but because that's the only possibility that's ever really been presented to them by society. Okay, so now that we understand Compet, we can see how Pacifica's whole deal can be seen as a microcosm of that. Pacifica has everything. She is a bleach blonde, successful girl who has never struggled with fitting in with society's expectations of a female-coded person under her circumstances. Everyone loves her. She's pretty. She's rich. So why isn't she happy? Why does she feel like being the perfect rich imitation of her parents and upholding the status quo is the only possibility, while still feeling stifled by that possibility? If you include the coding about the emphasis on her beauty and femininity and the emphasis that her family places on her presenting herself in the way they see fit and fitting in with who they happen to be. Now remember Pacifica, winning is everything. Oh, oh, and also looks. Winning and looks. It's suddenly relatable for a whole new rainbow of reasons. And suddenly, her relationship with Mabel, and the way that Mabel kind of encourages Pacifica to be someone completely different, someone outside of who her family says she has to be, it becomes something else. After all, if there's one thing that the comic showed us, it's that Pacifica is much happier if she's being herself. When she's separating herself from the strict expectations placed on her. And that's pretty gay to me. But hey. It's probably all projection, anyways. Dipper is possibly the character in the show who is the most commonly headcanoned as trans by fans. I've seen some pushback on this in fandom circles, partly because detractors say that it might be relying on stereotypes of trans men, because Dipper is seen as a noodle-armed, unmanly person with a girly scream. I began to keep a journal. I'm gonna sidestep this argument for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I don't think any 12 year old, regardless of designated gender at birth, is going to be particularly manly. So when it comes to trans mask headcanons of child characters, it's gonna be difficult to find representation that feels meaningful to everybody. Secondly, I'm not talking here about cisgender fans relying on stereotypes. I'm talking about trans audience members who, regardless of whether or not they think it's canon, love the idea of it because they see a little bit of their experience in Dippers. In the episode Dipper vs. Manliness, Dipper finds a community of manly minotaurs, the Manotaurs. They have a society in the woods formed on hyperaggression and violent manliness. They ask Dipper to perform an act of violence to prove himself as a man, and when he refuses, he finds his own definition of what it means to be a man outside of their societal expectations. And finding your own definition of gender expression outside of the traditional expression is related to a lot of trans people. Now, I want to stress again that I'm not going to say or imply that Dipper is canonically meant to be trans. After all, Mabel and Stan spend the bulk of this episode making fun of him for not being manly enough. Pretty fucked up if he is trans. We're not talking about canonical queer representation here. We're talking about qualities and tropes that we can recognize from our own lives in a character. This is illustrated even further in the Bottomless Pit segment, VoiceOver. Dipper feels self-conscious about his voice cracking. He runs into Old Man McGucket who offers him a potion that will make his voice super deep and manly. I'm just a 12 year old boy. You expect me to believe that, you crazy voice punk? Wait, no, I By the end of the episode, Dipper learns to accept his voice for what it is and he changes back. It's interesting because on one hand, this episode is about a male person's voice changing, something that's almost exclusively associated in media with cisgender boyhood and puberty, and yet it resonates with a queer audience, and trans masculine audiences in particular. They see their own struggle in this. Voice dysphoria is a very trans thing. In the context of taking hormones, a potion of some kind, to change your voice 
it's a very trans masculine thing. So when you mix this episode with Dipper talking about being teased in school, or about how he wears his vest to look like he has broader shoulders, or about him wearing a t-shirt to the pool instead of going shirtless, or the fact that he goes by a name that is not his given name throughout the entirety of the show, or any number of instances where he talks about not feeling manly enough, well, a story that's relatable to trans mask audiences emerges. In the episode The Inconvenience, seeing Dipper and Mabel talk about how when Dipper was younger, his parents would dress him up in a cute little lamb costume, and he'd do a little dance and sing a song about grazing. By the end of the episode, he must perform the song and dance to defeat the ghosts. It almost makes sense with context. But I imagine seeing this would be particularly significant to young trans mask youth and other AFAB queer youth who have experiences with parents pressuring them to dress hyper-femininely or in a way that doesn't align with their gender identity. And I imagine Wendy's discretion at the end, when she doesn't tell the group about the song and dance, would be something like wish fulfillment to a lot of people. Having a friend who knows they're trans but who you can trust to keep it to themselves. At least, that's what it would feel like if looking at the story with a trans lens. Looking at the conversation of trans stereotypes being applied to headcanons, it gets messy. After all, there are some trans people who might feel seen in Dipper's experiences. There are some who might not. The debate over what makes trans representation meaningful is a long and fraught one, and one I'm not prepared to have in this already too long video. But I will say that Bloves and Durland, our canon queer characters, aren't the most flattering representation of gay love either. Hell, if Wendy is coded as bisexual, then her being framed as someone who dates a lot non-committally is also a stereotype. The list goes on and on, and I think only accepting headcanons if they're perfect is an exercise in futility. So, I'm not going to tackle that argument here. It is moot to the point. This video isn't about representation. If it was, I'd cover Dead End Paranormal Park, or the lesbians in the Buzz Lightyear movie, or some shit like that. This video is about feeling seen in something that probably wasn't even made for you to feel seen in. Speaking of which... Stanford Pines grew up in Glassyard Beach, New Jersey, with his twin brother, Stanley. They were the poor children of an immigrant father living in the lead paint district, in their small apartment above the family pawn shop. While Stan occasionally seems to have gone on a date, we don't really have any indication that Stan or Ford had anyone they could really depend on aside from one another. And Ford felt like a freak, like an outcast, like he didn't belong, and he was mocked for his anomaly having six fingers. I don't think I need to explain too deeply why a queer person watching this might feel something. Who amongst us in this community hasn't felt like an outcast, a weirdo, someone who didn't belong among our peers for something inherent to our being that we had no control over? Forward being different is coding in itself, something that's relatable to a queer eye, and something that makes it easy for us to see ourselves in. On the same page where he talks about how strange he is and how people have found him strange his entire life, he says he's always been attracted to the strange, and the strange has always been attracted to him. Immediately after this, he contrasts himself and his odd interests with the interests of his football-playing classmates. It's a coding staple to pose athleticism as opposite of queerness. We might also find this isolation familiar. Feeling misunderstood by everyone around you means that you tend to withdraw away towards only the people who get you. In the case of Stanford, that would have been Stanley, up until he thought that his brother betrayed him during the science fair incident, and then Stan was kicked out. But there is something that Ford really excelled in, academics. That was his in. It was the way he was going to branch out into this world. And going by the journal, being recognized as a scientist was, in Ford's mind, the only way that he'd make a name for himself. Only if the freak returned a hero. It's kind of similar to Stan's journey for approval. Just like Stan thought that he wasn't worth anything and that his value hinged on making money, Ford seems to have hinged a lot of his value on scientific prowess and academics. Something notable from flashbacks featuring Ford's childhood is just how much less interested in dating he seems compared to Stan. Stan is surrounded by photos of babes. He mentions babes. The closest thing that Ford has to this pinup calendar 
is a poster of Nikola Tesla in his college dorm. Well, he does mention Kathy Crenshaw in the journal. She's a girl whose hand he tried to hold, and then she screamed. He brings this up when he's 30. You were eight, Ford. <laughs> I promise, I know trauma sucks, but like... Bruh, this is your scientific journal, not your diary. <laughs> there is a cut subplot on Carla McCorkle, or another girl that they would have invented for the deleted storyline, as mentioned in Natal Who Stands DVD commentary. She would have, if the story went this way, been a girl that the boys fought over until they went their separate ways, ruining their brotherhood. That bitch! We don't know much else about his college years as it pertains to his dating life, but we do know that he started playing Dee Dee and Morty in the 1970s, and his classmates called it girlfriend repellent. And then after that, he got buff. Like, he started working out. And going by the journals, it wasn't to impress any ladies. It was so that he didn't end up looking like Nikola Tesla did when he was in his 70s. So... Stanford Pines moves to Gravity Falls to investigate the anomalies of the area. He says about Gravity Falls that it's the first place that he truly belongs. It was finally a place where I felt at home. After years of not fitting in at home, at high school, at college, he's found a new home. A place that weirdos like him can fit in. And who does he fit in amongst? Monsters. Cryptids. He looks for Bigfoot. He lends money to Mothman. He kidnaps gnomes. And to talk about the coding they're in, we need to make a quick stop. Hi, welcome to the Monsters Are Gay Tangent Corner. I'm your host, a gay monster. In film history, the monster has long been an allegory for the other, the strange, the scary. The monster can play on the same fears that the audience might have about, say, an atomic disaster. Perhaps it can represent, in their minds, the feeling they would have to a rise of outsiders, a wave of people unfamiliar to you. But because of the way that the Hayes Code worked in merging undesirable characteristics, such as those we affiliate with queer, black, and brown people, into movie villains, those qualities were often integrated into monsters as well. Especially since, in early cinema, to be a monster was to be a villain, similar to how to be marginalized is to be criminalized and vilified within society. It's how we end up with animated films like the Flip the Frog animated short Soda Squirt from 1933. In the animation, a gay man turns into a monster and his gay and monstrous qualities are meant to inform one another. One might say that 30s, 40s, and 50s monster movie coding actually predates the Hayes Code and actually stems back to Birth of a Nation an incredibly racist KKK propaganda film from 1915. It uses the tropes and narrative devices that since then were applied to monsters like Creature of the Black Lagoon. In Birth of a Nation, it applies these tropes to an actor in blackface as a villain who's pursuing a white woman. Frankly, queer and racial coding in inhuman creatures basically defined a lot of Hollywood's earliest racial and queer diversity. So it's no wonder that over the years, as monsters became more complex and fun, marginalized groups have found the monster creatures, like the creature of the Black Lagoon, to be more sympathetic and to be more relatable. These monsters were more like us than the white cishet male protagonists ever would be. And particularly in Creature of the Black Lagoon, we have a monstrous villain that will never belong to a society of people who love and accept him because of his innate monstrosity. And when he falls in love with and pursues Kay, the white female damsel, he is riddled with bullets and set to the bottom of the lagoon. Even outside of monster movies, and specifically talking about cryptids, which I would argue are just monsters with dedicated museums and the occasional drunk witness, there is definitely overlap between cryptid-loving spaces and the queer community. The same way that queer people have sympathized with movie monsters, we've latched onto cryptids. It's a thing. Go to these museums in the middle of the redwoods and you'll find pride flags and stickers right next to the freedom over fear window signs and the we don't call 911 memorabilia. And why wouldn't we relate? A strange being that defies all rules of society is typically presented as genderless 
and that's surrounded by people doubting its existence? What's not to love? There's also a lot of subtext with monster movies, and we could spend the next few minutes unraveling the coding behind a monster's romantic pursuits, or what it means when, in more modern iterations of the trope, a human protagonist is pursuing the monster romantically. But luckily, we don't gotta jump into all that. Let's get out of the corner. So Ford was investigating the cryptids and monsters of Gravity Falls. In that time, he found living dinosaurs. He uncovered a conspiracy. He dated a siren. Ah, oh, god damn it! Hi, welcome to the monster fucking is gay tangent corner. I'm your host, a gay monster fucker. Why is it always the fish people? So I've established that the monster is often an allegory for whatever it is that society is afraid of or that society deems to be different. And that coding has long since made monsters, like villains, to be sympathetic to queer audiences and marginalized audiences in general. We have the creature of the Black Lagoon from the Amazon. We have King Kong, the giant monster from the Indian Ocean. And both fall in love with and pursue a white woman. Again, the insidious coding of the marginalized is ever-present. Both of the romances in these stories are framed as forbidden and wrong. This is as good a place as any to note that while I wrote a lot of this section beforehand on my own, I recently rewatched Lindsay Ellis' and Laurent Reedus' videos on The Shape of Water, and they make a lot of the same points here, basically much better and much more fleshed out. But this is my first YouTube video. I cannot spend a combined 40 minutes talking about monster fucking in a Gravity Falls video essay. So go watch those if you're interested in this type of queer meta-analysis. Meanwhile, I'll try to be concise and probably fail. Also imperative to the early monster movie formula is Frankenstein's monster, a sympathetic creature, or at least sympathetic compared to Dr. Frankenstein, who begged his creator to make him a companion, a bride of cadaver flesh, someone who would love him back because nobody in human society ever would, someone just like him. And you feel for him as you watch the tale unfold. In later monster movies like King Kong, the movie postulates on at least some level, Aw oh man, it sure is sad that the monsters have to die when all they want is love. Ah well. So it's no wonder that marginalized people, including queer people, begin to sympathize with and romanticize the monster. And we get more nuanced stories. And we get stories where we root for the human monster romance. We get Shrek. We get Twilight we get Sonic 06. And eventually, we get Shape of Water. And what are all of these, or at least most of these? A story where an outcast to society, someone who is treated as inhuman, finds love. I don't know, man. Sounds pretty gay to me. Attracted to the strange, indeed. Authentic Bigfoot caller. Gently blow. To create a low-pitched sound that Bigfoot finds irresistible. Come and get it, Bigfoot. Where are the Bigfoots at? Bigfoots? Big feet? You know what they say about big feet, don't you? They travel in groups and can crush your spine like a twig. That's what they should say. Okay, enough of that. You think Ford ever watched Creature from the Black Lagoon? He grew up in the right era for it. And conversation about queer identity aside, he was a poor Jewish child growing up in the 50s and 60s. He was marginalized in class and religion. Maybe it would have made an impact on him. Who knows? And if it did make an impact, who's to say what kind of impact it would be? You know, they never did specify that Siren's gender in the comics. I know mythologically speaking that Sirens were typically women, but they also used to be half-bird people, and that's not how we think of them now. Also, Mothman lives in West Virginia and has red eyes, but in the series he has yellow eyes and lives in the Pacific Northwest. I don't think we need to apply accurate folklore to Gravity Falls. I mean, at that point we're just overthinking a kid's show, come on. And by the way, a woman siren? Everyone knows the most fitting identity for a sea monster is gender fluid. Not to mention, I don't think I've ever come across a single piece of fan art where the siren was a woman. Even in the boom of Ford X siren content to come out after the comics. Gravity Falls fans, man. We know what we're about. The interesting thing about sirens, though, mythologically speaking, 
is that they operate by manipulating their human victims. Hmm. That probably won't come up again later. So, Ford was getting desperate. His benefactors would stop funding him if he didn't come up with something concrete, and he needed to find out where Gravity Falls' weirdness came from. So, he did what anyone would do. He began to create a gateway between worlds. Unfortunately, he didn't have all of the know-how he needed to do this, nor did he have the technology. He ransacked a UFO that had landed in the Gravity Falls Valley for the tech, and he reached out to Philford, his old college buddy, to come up from Palo Alto, California, and join him in creating the portal. He describes himself as being overcome with emotion. The sight of his old classmate upon his doorstep filled his heart with much joy and gratitude. Fiddleford had left behind his wife and child in California temporarily while he was helping Ford with his project. Ford says that, quote, After all these years of self-imposed solitude, how wonderful it is to have a friend by my side. So Fiddleford unpacks, he gets comfortable. He puts a photo of his wife on his desk. He says it keeps him grounded. Ford remarks that he has a similar photo on his desk of Nikola Tesla. Ah, you have a photo of a man on your desk that you say functions similarly to a photo that your coworker has of his wife. Nothing about that indicates attraction. So Alex Hirsch has actually weighed in on the bond between Ford and Fiddleford. On a charity stream from 2016, I believe, he was asked if Fiddleford loved Ford. And he answered that- Does McGucket love Stanford? Um, as, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like, everybody has that one friend in school who, like, school would be a nightmare without them. You know, like, one person who's on your level who makes the same dumb jokes, like, who's, like, into the same, like, weird games that you are, or just, like, gets your sense of humor, um, and, like, it can, it can be, like, the most meaningful thing in the world to have that person. Like, I feel like every place I've been, I've had at least one really good friend who, like, I can get through how awful it is because they're there. And I think, uh, you know, um, McGucket and, and Ford were those kinds of friends um, until things sort of fell apart. I, I will say, I do appreciate knowing where he's coming from and what the angle was when he wrote these two. This is actually a good place to mention that I don't really think there's a lot of queer coding in the text surrounding Fiddleford. That doesn't mean that he's coded as straight, like that's not how it works. There just wasn't anything that I recognized personally. Well, I mean, I guess he's not very athletically built, which can be used in tandem with queer coding. And well, I mean, he's anxious, which honestly is relatable to a lot of queer people. It just doesn't have the same very loaded coding as like Stanley being rejected by his family and thrown out, you know? Like there's not really a queer analog for erasing your memory with a gun. As I'm editing this, I'm realizing something that I feel is rather obvious in retrospect. The memory gun may actually have a queer analog. In the show, the memory gun is specifically an invention designed to alter someone's brain with electrical pulses. It's an item invented by Philford so that he can erase a part of himself, a part of his being that causes him distress. And specifically when he erases his memory of the portal that he helped build and the fear of the coming apocalypse, a part of his being that causes him immense guilt. When I put it like this, I hope it becomes apparent how, through a queer perspective, and especially the perspective of a religious man who lived through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the memory gun can be seen as reminiscent of the use of electric shock therapy in gay conversion therapy, mostly from the 1950s to the 1980s. I think a lot of the points I make later on in the video still stand, and I also don't think that the memory gun is a one-to-one -one metaphor for electric shock therapy or anything like that. But I think that those interpretive themes of guilt, self-loathing, and wanting to remove a part of yourself, filtered through the intersection of religion and sexuality, present a compelling argument, or at least a compelling headcanon. Outside of all this, he's a deeply religious and superstitious man with a wife and a child in a suburban home. None of this is specifically exclusive to being queer. Plenty of queer people live in the suburbs and have a wife and kid. It's just 
isn't what you would expect as coding. Of note here, I am not every single queer person ever. I can't look at Fiddleford with the perspective of every identity. It's very possible there's additional layers of queer coding here, just not ones that I personally see. Like, I'm not every gender. I'm only about four fifths of them. Queer discourse works best when it's an ongoing conversation between different facets of the community. So regardless of all that, despite his limited time on screen, Fiddleford is actually half of two of the most popular MLM pairings in Gravity Falls fandom, Fiddlestan and Fid Author. I'm not gonna talk about number one guys, I'm tired, please. Looking back on AO3, there were exactly three fanfictions that had McGucket labeled as a character in the tags before the day that Society of the Blind Eye from season two aired. This isn't too surprising. After all, this is the episode that Fiddleford McGucket kind of became a character, as opposed to a one-note, mentally ill, homeless stereotype. And yes, I know that there's a lot of Appalachian stereotyping in there too. Like, someone might argue they're not making fun of the mentally ill, the homeless are making fun of hillbillies, but one, a lot of it is mentally ill and homeless stereotyping. And also, even if it is only Appalachian or hillbilly stereotyping, y'all realize that's bad too, right? Like, that's just classism in disguise. It's classism with glasses and a bushy mustache. But that aside, it isn't lost to me that most of the fics written about McGucket after this point put him in a romantic pairing with Stan or Ford. Or, rather, with Stanford and his brother, the author of the journals, Lee. <laughs> Do I gotta explain this for true? It was, it was quite a time, man. It was quite a time. Someone's gotta do a video on Mystery Trio. I don't know if it's gonna be me, but someone's gotta. Just a heads up, by the way, this is the only bit of the video where I really talk about shipping specifically. And even so, I'm only bringing it up to note how interesting it is that half of the pairing has a lot of coding attached to it, but the other half doesn't, at least not that I can tell. And that's the thing, I don't think it's Fiddleford's coding that contributes to him being shipped with these men. I think it's their coding and their proximity to Fiddleford. Him being roommates with Ford in college, him leaving behind a wife and child to work with Ford, him working on the lab and the portal and the bunker with Ford, putting his life at a standstill to help his friend. One of the few things we learn about Fiddleford in Society of the Blind Eye is that he was working with the author of the journals. Someone who we knew, or guessed, had six fingers on each hand. Someone who was a weird traveling researcher who went to Gravity Falls to explore the paranormal. And we had basically no other information. So people looked at that, and they looked at the fact that there was only one bed in the bunker, and they went, ah oh, yeah, they fucked. And a ship doesn't really have too much of a leg to stand on nowadays. But that wasn't always the case. So after Fiddleford arrives in Gravity Falls, he and Ford take a hike to the UFO crash site landing. On the way, they camp out and they're looking up at the stars and they begin to talk about their dreams and aspirations. Fiddleford mentions that he wants to head back home and patent some of his inventions and make robotics that improve people's lives. Fiddleford mentions that he grew up dirt poor in Tennessee and he wants to finally have some stability and financial success in his life. And Ford says that he can relate to these ambitions. Ford discusses his dreams of proving his theory. After he proves the grand unified theory of weirdness, he can return home to the East Coast and the freak would return a hero. He wants to be the toast of the scientific community. He wants to make his family and his hometown proud. So Philford seems confused by this. He's like, why do you want to do all this? Like, you can probably make some good money off just publishing what you have now. You've discovered so many amazing things. Why not publish now? Settle down. Start a family. And Ford laughs at the thought. Romance, he says, is far more baffling to him than all the mysteries of the universe. And he talks about how important it is that he be the one to discover this theory. He wants his name in the history books. And then he says, and I quote, It hasn't been an easy path, but I prefer the road less traveled anyway. Although I confided in Fiddleford that I was grateful to no longer be traveling alone. That's what it says in the first edition of Journal 3. And you'll notice I said first edition because there were some later changes made to the journal. 
And I'm not talking about just adding blacklight. For one thing, there were a bunch of typos in Journal 3. The most obvious one is in the sentence about his tattoos, so I believe there's a couple more. And honestly, I thought the typos were on purpose. I thought it was like, oh man, Ford's out here being like, grammar Stanley, but he doesn't know how to spell tattoos. Spelling Stanford. So yeah, they did fix the spelling mistakes in future editions of Journal 3, which means Ford can spell just fine. Alex Hirsch just can't, which is pretty funny. Am I being mean? Am I bullying Alex? Look, Alex, I don't mean any ill will. Feel free to reach out if I'm being too mean. Just, you know, use spell check. I think he misspells occurring, like, in two different ways at some point. I gotta look into that. I'll put it up on screen if I can find what I'm talking about. Ooh, this is gonna be a fun edit. I'm gonna track down the typos. I'm gonna do it, Alex. I'm gonna put them all in one spot. I'm actually really excited about it. Another change that was made is that pages are much less splotchy in future editions. Um, it's a bit easier to read, fewer splotches covering up text, and also the pages are lighter in general. Just a less dark shade of beige. And also, they fix the binding. Listen, I treat this old edition of the journal very delicately because I've had to get it, like, re-glued because the binding is falling apart. And if I want to buy another Journal 3, I can't buy the old edition again. They don't sell it anymore. It's honestly just as much of a treasured book to me as this Blacklight edition at this point. I mean, there were probably more than 10,000 sold, but how many of them lasted, you know? I bet a bunch of people replaced it. And it's a shame if they did, because there's one last big change to it. So you heard me read this line. I'm happy to no longer be traveling this road alone, or something like that. You want to know what it says in the new edition? I'm happy to be traveling it with a friend. Why did they change this, you know? Is it for some kind of accuracy thing? Like, is it maybe like, ah, maybe he wasn't alone before because he technically had Bill. I'm like, yeah, but... He also considered Bill to be a friend before this, so it's not like he suddenly has a friend when he didn't before. So, what could it be? I mean, I think I know what it could be. I think they thought it sounded kind of gay and they changed it. Is he, you know, happy to no longer be traveling alone? Let me take off this jacket. I need to take off my jacket for this. I don't know how Ford does this shit, man. <laughs> In the summer, too. And you know, the thing is, I didn't even think the line was that gay. I mean, I'm happy I'm not alone. That doesn't necessarily indicate romance, you know? Until Disney changed it. I mean, this is Disney censorship. What can be more gay than Disney censorship? I mean, they could have made out in the back seat full-on Grunkle dating sim style and described it in full detail on that page, and it would have been less gay than Disney censorship. I actually made a Twitter thread about this a few years ago. I was talking about how I really miss the ambiguity of the old line, because even though I don't think the author is intended for it to come across as gay, that ambiguity and that queer coding means a lot to people. And I actually tagged Rob Renzetti and Alex Hirsch in the thread, and Rob Renzetti replied. He said that he didn't sign off on the change, and he didn't think that Alex Hirsch did either. So if he didn't change it, and Alex didn't change it, then it seems like somebody at Disney Publishing changed it. And I can't think of any reason that Disney Publishing would want to get rid of this line outside of removing any accidental implications of romance. And that's something we should talk about. Aromantic and asexual readings of Ford's text aren't that hard to find. In some ways, the text can be even more explicitly aromantic asexual than other types of queer identity. For example, the line about romance baffling him. It's specifically a line that codes someone as aromantic. And the rest of it, the isolation, the feeling out of place, the feeling like an anomaly, like you don't belong in society. They all make sense regardless of what type of queer lens you apply, whether you see Ford as gay, as bi, as ace, or as aromantic. 
And I actually wanted to take a moment here to talk about a response that I got about that Twitter thread that I posted. The one about the bean page. So the person who posted a reply said that they were actually happy with the change because it made an aromantic reading of the text more apparent. And they indicated that they were hopeful that someone at Disney had done it intentionally. I dismissed this at the time because I didn't think that Disney had that intention. And like, I still do. It has nothing to do with it being aromantic coding. It has to do with the fact that Disney is a mega corporation that doesn't care about any kind of queer representation. I just don't trust Disney to think about it like that. But I actually really understand this person's frustration with everyone being upset about the change. Aromantic coding that we have seen in media before is pretty thin on the ground. And when it is present, it looks like roboticness or emotional coldness. It's not a true reflection of what the aromantic or asexual experience looks like. It's just what cishet people over the years have decided it should look like. So having an implication of romantic interest being removed, particularly on the same page that Ford says that romance baffles him, I understand that that might be meaningful. Especially because Ford would defy aromantic stereotyping. He's definitely not emotionally cold. He's passionate about everything he talks about. That being said, confirmation or even recognizing coding of aromantic asexual identity is kind of difficult. Gay or bisexual or pansexual coding usually relies on the presence of something. A close friendship with someone of the same gender. A longing glance. A hand on the knee. Flannel. Whereas recognizing someone as aromantic or asexual usually means the lack of all of these things. For a mass audience to recognize it at least. And there needs to be something clear in the text confirming a lack of sexual or romantic interest. Without coding that clearly indicates a lack of interest, an audience member is free to just assume, oh, they're just not attracted to anyone in this specific scene or on this specific page. And people assume that because we live in an allonormative society. So the line change to something specifically platonic was meaningful to this person, to someone who saw Ford's traits as an extension of aromantic or asexual coding. But I still do miss the old line. And the fact that it seems to be an instance of censoring rubs me the wrong way. After all, other instances in the book of Ford mentioning girls or wanting girls to notice him weren't equally stifled, so... Yeah. Ford saying in the original line that he's happy to no longer be alone isn't explicitly romantic either. Like, it wouldn't contradict an earlier interpretation of him being aromantic. Not to mention, aromantic and asexual people can still enjoy companionship, they just might not specifically want sexual or romantic companionship. And I think this line just symbolizes Ford shedding some of that isolated nature. He's not as alone as he used to be. The ambiguity offered something. And if we weren't going to get canon representation in the Pines family, that ambiguity was the next best thing. I wanted to give those specific readings of Ford a space in this video, because I think Arrow Ace readings are commonly overlooked in queer meta-analysis of a text. You know, we shouldn't treat queer coding analysis like this video as a contest of which labels fit a character more. If you ask me, the more queer people of any background who can find comfort and relatability in a character, the better. In that vein, there are some people who I've seen push the idea that Ford being aromantic or asexual or really any kind of queer can't be the case because of the presence of passages in the book about Ford wanting girls to like him. And also this weird drawing of a brain. Though interestingly, in the Blacklight edition, the word ladies is crossed out with the word lies. Like, that's something, right? That's gotta be something. These mentions of the ladies don't invalidate queer coding. Remember, recognizing queer coding is not literal. Like, Jafar is queer coded, but he still wants Jasmine, so Jafar straight coded? No. Queer coding does not equal actual representation. It's media analysis. It's a metaphor, Hazel Grace. But if you really needed me to prove its validity, if you wanted me to hold our coding as a literal interpretation of the man, fine. Let's do that.
I'd begin with the fact that there are mentions of Ford wanting women to notice him, but not a lot about him noticing women. He was a guy in the 80s who wanted stardom and acclaim. Women wanting a man in power was likely the imagery of success he was surrounded with growing up. We could just see it as an extension of a power fantasy. And even if we take it to mean that he was sexually or romantically interested in women, I think it's very... how do I put this? It's very gold star lesbian ideology to think that this means he can't be gay or aromantic or asexual, you know? I mean, for one thing, a lot of gay people take that time to figure themselves out. And also, a lot of asexual people still find people attractive, even if they're not attracted to them sexually. They're ace, not blind. And when terminology like asexual or aromantic aren't in the public lexicon, like, you know, in a hick town in the woods in 1981, it can be difficult for someone to figure it out for themselves, or to parse out the difference between societal pressure to find people attractive and actual attraction, and especially when compounded with societal pressure to conform. Not to mention, bisexuality, pansexuality, gray sexuality, gray romanticism, all of these concepts exist, as does the concept of just questioning oneself and trying new things. So those labels and experiences can apply, even if you did want to dismiss a gay or aromantic or asexual reading. Which, why would you want to do that? Come on! I say all this to specify that when I say queer, I'm including all of these readings. Aromantic, asexual, bisexual, all of them. Because like the queer community, a queer analysis would not be complete without them. So regardless of any coding of any feelings between Ford and Fiddleford, Ford doesn't necessarily treat Fiddleford the best at all times. For example, he seems to have a very boomer-esque dismissal of Fiddleford's anxiety. Fiddleford will be in the middle of a panic attack after seeing his worst fear in the eyes of a Gremoblin, and Ford will be like, I don't know, go breathe about it. And he begins to take Fiddleford's anxiety as a lack of commitment to the project. He begins really wondering if Fiddleford is there for him, if he's going to be able to go through with completing the gateway. But it isn't 100% Ford's fault. After all, Ford has somebody else whispering in his ear. Hello. In the last Mabel Corn, we learn about Ford and Bill's relationship. Bill had met Ford years before he started building the portal, watching him within birch trees, waiting to be summoned. And when he was summoned, according to Journal 3, even then he bided his time. He spent about two years only giving Ford sporadic visions and clues through his dreams. Premonitions about what Ford would find in specific spots began to come true. Bill was playing the long con. But Ford's research wasn't moving fast enough. His benefactors needed more progress, and he needed his grant. He needed his research. After all, how else would he ever become more than just a freak? And it was when Ford was desperate that Bill struck. And so, he told Ford how to make a gateway into another dimension. And Ford believed him. He believed that that's all that it was. After all, he thought Bill was his friend. And why wouldn't he? With all of Bill's help, and the flattery, and the validation. Ford, in turn, it seems, might have worshipped Bill. He called him a muse, got golden effigies placed all over his home, bought stained glass windows and carpets to match. You know, that thing you do for your friend? <laughs> Plaster an image all over your home? I mean, it in no way indicates an obsession. What? And even aside from this, from the worship, he trusted Bill more than anyone. And Bill began to whisper in Ford's ear that Fiddleford wasn't committed enough to the portal in the basement. And over time, Ford begins to believe him. And he begins to believe that Bill is his only true friend. Eventually, he gives Bill access to his body. 
He allows Bill Cipher to possess him in his sleep. He doesn't even have awareness of what Bill does in his body. He just wakes up with mystery bruises. It's a massive shell of trust and a massive mistake. So he finds out that his muse was a monster, preying on his insecurities and ego to manipulate him, and Ford pledges to stop him, but it's too late. He's unable to sleep without risking Bill turning on the gateway in the basement, except for the moments when, overcome with exhaustion, he accidentally falls asleep. And then Bill takes control. Until Ford is pushed through the interdimensional portal for three decades. The first time we see Bill and Ford interact on screen is actually then, in The Last Mablecorn. Bill ruffles his hair. He calls him cute. He puts an arm around him and calls him by his childhood nickname. And we have this over-familiarity from a villain character that I mentioned before. And I'm not going to say that we're supposed to look at this and assume that Bill and Ford have romantic history. After all, like I said, this affectionate body language is just what villains are like nowadays. But I will say that I distinctly remember the first thing I saw on tumblr.com.net.gov that night, the night that that episode premiered, being a post reading, I can't believe Ford fucked the triangle. <laughs> So whether it was intended or not, some people saw it. And regardless of whether or not it's considered a gay reading or a friendly reading, Ford's relationship to Bill is inherently abusive. It's blatantly abusive. Like, in the text, there's no denying it. It's all there, waiting until he's vulnerable, isolating him away from his friends, Convincing him that Bill is the only one who could ever truly love him and understand him. And finally, complete control. And it brings us to a point that is all too familiar. I am not going to say that being abusive is a queer trait. It is an evil trait. Anyone, gay, straight, etc., can be evil. We love equal opportunity in this house. But homophobia and transphobia can create environments conducive with abuse. Isolation caused by rejection of one's family, of one's friends, of one's peers can actually make it very easy for someone to crave intimacy, to crave trust, and to crave acceptance. And if people can't find acceptance at home, they're more likely to trust those who do accept them elsewhere. If Ford's anomaly is seen through a queer lens, meaning he's gone his entire life isolated and rejected by his peers for being different, it makes sense to see the way that he falls for flattery similarly to how a lot of queer young people struggle to find safe places. They struggle to find places where they're accepted for who they are, and they often end up in some pretty dangerous places as a result. This is actually the experience of myself and my queer friends who didn't have family and who needed to find a family of their own. Sometimes on the route to found family, you find a few wolves on the way. Ford had one friend growing up who embraced him for who he was, Stanley. And then that person was gone. And regardless of the circumstances of the science fair incident, Ford did think that Stan did it on purpose, that Stan had betrayed him. So, after this perceived betrayal, he was alone. It isn't uncommon for predatory people to strike when a victim is at their most alone, their most insecure, their most vulnerable. Outcasts to the herd make for easy picking. So, when I watched this unfold, watched Ford isolate himself into the woods, among those who were like him, isolated into vulnerability, it felt familiar, and yes, relatable to an experience held by many queer people. Slightly related, it's one of the reasons that don't say gay bills are so dangerous. Cat Black actually has a really fascinating video talking about this. I'll link it down below. When queer youth don't have a setting at school or home where they can safely be themselves, 
They isolate themselves away from possible support networks, away from teachers, away from social workers, because they're unable to trust anyone enough to find safe channels. And if a predatory person is the only person who gives that child a place to be themselves, then the child is going to trust them, and that child is at risk of being preyed upon. Any person, regardless of whether or not they're part of the LGBTQ plus community, is more vulnerable to dangerous or abusive people if they're unhappy and alone. Because vulnerable people crave that acceptance from any source that they can get it from. And in this case, I don't think it's so out of left field to relate to what Ford went through. Bill Cipher was a predatory creature. He sought out those who needed validation, and he offered it. And the validation he offered, the assurance that Ford was going to be a great scientist, that he was going to change the world, that one day he was going to be somebody. Somebody who wasn't just different. It preyed on all the things that Ford was most ashamed of. And in turn, Bill became one of the only people that Ford could trust. To be clear, it isn't queerness that makes someone vulnerable, but the shame and loneliness that comes with rejection of queer identity. This is why spaces at home and school that are accepting are a good defense against predatory people. He really trusted Bill completely. And when you trust someone like that, mind and body and soul, <laughs> let me tell you, waking up is a bitch. <sighs> Frankly, none of these individual elements are specifically exclusive to a gay or trans or queer experience. Straight people can be weird. Cis people can fall for cons. Heteronormative people can fall into abusive relationships. Cishet people can feel insecure about their place in the world. They can feel isolated. They can feel like they can't trust many people. They can find kinship among those on the outskirts of society. And hell, anyone can summon a demon. But all of these things together feels... Well, it feels queer. It feels relatable through a queer lens. There are things I should probably note. A lot of these codings feel like they could be a reading of Ford as neurodivergent instead of, or in addition to, a queer reading. Feelings of feeling off, feeling like you don't belong, feeling excluded from society. It's relatable to more than just queer people. After all, there's a visionary code in the journal that translates to the most impossible thing to decode is human social behavior. And I have my own personal headcanons, but they don't matter here, nor do the intentions of Alex Hirsch. Again, this is not about what the writers intended. This is why LGBTQ people flock to these characters. So, what happens in the aftermath? Let's read. This is what Ford has to say when Fiddleford leaves the project. After everything we have done together, he had the nerve to grow cold feet now. After he had succeeded in being the first man to enter a parallel dimension, he took this gift and threw it away. Imagine if Neil Armstrong's first words on the moon were, I quit. <laughs> well, good riddance, F, you weak-willed hayseed. Go back to your doting family and a life of fear and compromise. I weep now, not for a failed partnership, but for the golden opportunity thrown away. You weep, you say. To think I considered him a friend. I know my true friend. It is my muse. I will speak with him tonight. <sighs> you know, regarding Ford and Fiddleford's bond, we can't deny that it was at least close before all this happened. And a lot of people were hopeful about queer representation being someplace in Journal 3, especially fit authorshippers. After all, how unintentional could this be? If you don't recognize this frame, it's from The Last Mabelcorn. After Fiddleford falls headfirst into the gateway in the basement, the sequence looked like this in A Tale of Two Stands. 
But this, in the last Mablecorn flashback, changing the framing of the scene seems intentional, but who's to say why? It's possible they framed it like that just because it looked more dramatic than Ford attempting to shake the man awake like he did in Tal of Two Stands. But even so, it's something people noticed. And something people picked up on. <sighs> And while Fiddleford calls himself an assistant, what terminology does Ford use in this sequence? Until my partner got a glimpse of Bill's true plans. My partner. Two dudes sitting in a secret lab five feet apart because they're not gay. That was old as time. Something that I do think about constantly is just how horribly things ended with everyone that Ford trusted. Stan betrayed him. His muse used him, and Fiddleford, like, he saw Fiddleford as giving up on him, giving up on his dream, and regardless of how things turned out, <sighs> they were friends. They loved each other. They bantered about whether or not the shapeshifter was livestock. <sighs> about leg warmers. Ford bought the guy banjo strings on day one. And then, Ford was lost to the multiverse. And Philford was lost to himself. <sighs> it's no wonder that a lot of this coding was found in their journal. You know, Journal 3 is treated in some senses as kind of a grown man's diary of sorts. You know, when the Blacklight Journal was released, there was a not unconsiderable amount of fans who thought that queer representation would be included somewhere behind the paywall. Like, if Disney was gonna put it in there, that's where they'd put it. After all, how many homophobic parents are buying their kids $150 books for a cartoon that they like? There is more that we can talk about with Ford, if I wanted to put in more time. We can talk about how the only band he seems to ask about when he comes back is the Eurythmics. Which leads me to assume that the Eurythmics are his favorite music group. Which, like, 80s synth pop group the Eurythmics? Singers of sweet dreams are made of this. A song famously about the cycle of abuse. Those Eurythmics. A group including star Annie Lennox, who was known for her androgynous style, and revered and made an icon for the LGBTQ community of the 80s? That Eurythmics? Alex, we gotta talk about the Eurythmics. Did you not know about the Eurythmics? Were you just picking an 80s band with a song that gave you Ford vibes? What happened there? Shout out to the sirens outside. They're on their way to arrest you, Alex, <laughs> for doing this to me. What happened there? I mean, I know what happened. You asked, hey Rob, what's a song from the 80s? And Rob went, uh, sweet dreams are made of this? And you went, is that from 82 or 83? And Rob went, uh -huh. and you went, ah, fuck it, the timeline's all bullshit anyways. The Eurythmics. Is this all 3D chess representation? The bisexual flag on the coloring book? The night in Vegas with Goldie? The Eurythmics? Am I not giving Alex Hirsch enough credit? Am I giving Alex Hirsch too much credit? But yeah. There's a lot in the journal we can talk about. We can talk about Ford either hypothetically or literally having an alien girlfriend in a do-over dimension. We can talk about the password to the laptop that Fiddleford gave Ford being Stanford, which either is an indication that Fiddleford cared enough about Ford to make him his desktop password, or a joke about Ford being technologically unsavvy and just using his name as an insecure password. We can talk about the Oracle, another monster slash alien, and the Oracle's phone number. We can look at this tattoo and wonder, genuinely wonder, is this a tattoo that a straight cis man would get? And if I had it in me, we can talk about the DVD commentary kissing bot. 
Oh boy, that kissing bot. I can't do it. I talked about bodacious tea. I don't have it in me to analyze the coding behind the kissing bot. And besides, I don't have time to talk about the kissing bot. I have a road trip. This week, I'm going to Confusion Hill for the second time in my life. This time, with a group of Gravity Falls fans. We're sticking our queer asses in a van, and we're going to go up the Pacific Coast Highway. And we're going to see Bill Cipher. And then, we're going to flip off that son of a bitch. I took this trip before, but not with my closest friends from the fandom. And, honestly, the more I think about it, the more I'm still in awe at what this show has given me. Lifelong friends. So, come on. Let's see what we find in the Pacific Northwest. I'm headed off to Oshoshone Where the birds and the bees won't know me Men and war won't exist no more And there ain't no gals to keep no score I'm taking off for the woods To a place where there ain't no shirts Don't need no books or ponds or the ponderosas Don't need no lady or Mary the Mariposas Can't waste no time in getting there I'll do 80 down 80 without a prayer Don't need no gal, I'll spruce up for the spruces Don't need no pal, I'll change my mood up for the mooses Headed off to a Shoshone Where the birds and the bees won't know me Men and war won't exist no more And there ain't no gals to keep no score And if you're wondering where's my aspen It's been cavorting amongst the aspens Don't need no grass, I'll get altered among the alders Don't need no mass, I'll grovel before the boulders I'm headed off to a Shoshone Where the birds and the bees won't know me Men and war won't exist no more And there ain't no gals to keep no score I'm headed off to a Shoshone Where the elk and the owls won't know me Where there ain't no judges to whom I gotta plead Cause I can be me in old Shoshone So, I made it. It was the 10 year anniversary of Gravity Falls back in June, June of 2022. It's kind of wild. I rewatched the show like once a year, maybe twice. Well, that's generous. I rewatched season two twice a year. It's the better season. I don't know why I'm acting like it's a secret. It just is. I mean, both seasons have their flaws, but I don't really want to talk about any more flaws of this show I love. Like, I could sit here and tear apart certain character motivations, certain plot points that don't make that much sense. But I love this show. I love this series. If my apartment's on fire, I am grabbing my black light journal before I grab my social security cards. I don't want to nitpick about plot points that bug me. Well, maybe a little nitpicking as a treat. There. I nitpicked. So yeah, I love this show a lot. But this year was different because I finally decided to open up the box set and listen to the Gravity Falls DVD commentary. I'd had it for a long time, I just couldn't find it in me to open it up and watch it. I think it's because it's one of the last few pieces of Gravity Falls media I've yet to consume. And if I open it, that means it's over, isn't it? But I opened it. And when I did, I was kind of reminded by how different a lot of Alex Hirsch's descriptions of the character motivations, especially Ford's motivations, were from what I remembered. Like, Alex had expressed in the commentary, and before the commentary too, in interviews and stuff that were going on during the series' run, that this was a story about Ford's ego, about Ford thinking that he was better than everyone else. I believe he even says at one point that Ford thinks that Stan is the dumb twin. The implication here is that Ford thinks he's destined for greatness because he's innately better than everyone around him. But this was never quite what I saw. There was always a big difference between what Alex wrote and what I read. 
When I looked at Ford, I saw a possibly queer, definitely marginalized, overachieving, gifted student, a child of an immigrant who wanted to make a name for himself outside of the expectations placed on him and his siblings because there was something about him that was different. Something that made him feel like it was impossible for him to be what his family and what the world wanted him to be. And that's probably because I myself was a queer, definitely marginalized, overachieving, gifted student, child of an immigrant, someone who wanted to make a name for themselves outside of the expectations placed on me and my siblings because there was something about me that was different. Something about me that made it seem like I could never be what my family and what the world expected me to be. Um, projection alert? kind of cringe if you ask me. Leave a comment down below if you think I'm not well adjusted. So was I incorrect in my reading? I mean, maybe, but even if I was, it's allowed. We can be wrong. The United States Constitution gives us the legal right to be young, dumb, and full of incorrect head cannons. But I didn't make this show to talk about being upset. Instead, I want to talk about how while I was watching the show, it didn't even occur to me that Ford's intentions all stemmed from him thinking that he was super smart and gifted and that he deserved success because he was the smart twin. It didn't cross my mind. Part of that probably comes from which elements of the show that the creators meant as throwaway lines and which ones I took as defining characterization. Like in Dungeons Dungeons and More Dungeons, Ford talks about the infinity die and how it's illegal in 9,000 dimensions and how if it lands on the wrong side it can destroy the universe and how he keeps it in a cheap plastic case. I saw that and I loved him. I think that was the moment I became a huge Ford fan. This man has high intelligence, low wisdom, an absolute himbo of a scientist. I mean brain chock full of science, chock empty of thoughts. He's smart but he has no common sense and I love him. What a wonderful idiot. And in the DVD commentary, Alex Hirsch actually implies that he kind of regrets this line, that he doesn't think it's quite in character, that it would mean that Ford is reckless. Which like, what? He made a deal with a demon. He encourages Dipper to press random UFO buttons. He shaves with fire, Alex. But then again, there are details that were probably meant to be throwaway lines and jokes that I took as defining traits. I mean, nothing about my headcanon of Ford being defined by being queer, self-conscious, or an insecure man who didn't come from money who wanted to prove himself contradicted the text. But I'd assumed that my interpretation of the text was the intended one, and that it was what the writers had meant for us to see all along. And my legs were pretty tired from jumping to conclusions, ha-cha-cha. -cha. Of course, Alex wouldn't have seen the show that way. He's a white, assumedly straight, successful animation showrunner living in California. Meanwhile, I'm a non-binary journalist living in squalor in a Phoenix apartment. Please donate with the link in the description. Those yellow contacts were not cheap. So while I'm not upset that my headcanons were wrong, it is interesting that while I watched the show, that was what I assumed to be right. Like, it was the only interpretation that entered my mind. It wasn't even a rebellion against the intended message. I couldn't even read the intended message. So I wanted to track down the reasons why I read what I did. Why did I make the assumptions that I made? I mean, I definitely wasn't the only person to make those assumptions. The week of this road trip, I released a Google form to people in the fandom on Reddit, Tumblr, various Discord spaces, any space I can really get a hold of. On the forum, people could answer questions about who they thought was LGBTQIA+, while they watched the show, and why they headcanoned it. And the characters that they picked, and the reasons why they picked them, made a lot of sense. Hell, most of them are mentioned in this video. Dipper wanting people to see him as manly, Ford talking about how romance baffles him. It's all here, and a lot of people saw it. Hell, I didn't even put Blubs and Durland, the only canon queer characters in the show, on the survey. Now, my reasoning was this was about headcanon, not canon characters. But even before I specified that on the second day, I had six write-in votes for Pacifica, who I'd unfortunately forgotten to put in. Oops. 
and even two write-in votes for Manly Dan before I even got one vote for Blubs and Durland, the canon queer characters. I think everyone forgot about them. Interestingly, these were the characters who were most commonly reported to have queer headcanons associated with them, along with the labels that people most commonly associated with them. But there's one more thing. There was an option for people to list whether or not they were part of the LGBTQIA community. So in the general population of people who took the survey, these are the results of the people most commonly headcanoned as queer. But among people who listed themselves as straight, these are the characters that they most commonly thought were queer. It's kind of interesting what the difference is between these two groups. Even more interesting are some of the reasons that they gave. This is a limited pool, again, it's a really small number, but a lot of the reasoning that straight people who took the survey gave seemed somewhat baked in stereotype, whereas people who were part of the community seem to rely on similarities between experiences they've had and things that felt relatable. After all, a lot of straight viewers of Gravity Falls never saw any of this. A lot of the writers never seemed to see any of this either. But then again, they've lived in a society where maybe they never had to. I think that there's a tendency for people to look at these passionate LGBTQ plus headcanons and go, fans are crazy. They want everyone to be gay. But I think a lot of people forget that our options up until very recently were thin on the ground. Up until very recently in movies and TV shows and animation, we were only ever monsters and villains or the butts of the joke. Is it really so bad to see ourselves in badass lumberjacks or lovable but flawed old men? So this brings us back to why. Well, if you ask me, the reason that I saw the coding and why so many young queer Gravity Falls fans saw it is that up until very recently, queer people have had so little representation, so few places that we can see ourselves, that we've had to rely on coded pieces of metaphor within the subtext. We had to look at a picture that wasn't made to reflect us because no picture ever was, and then stuff ourselves awkwardly in there, like a puzzle piece that doesn't quite belong. And if there's anything that Gravity Falls fans love, it's puzzles. I miss Gravity Falls. I miss the heyday of the fandom. I miss how much I saw myself in this show. And I miss Stanford Pines. <sighs> but my aim is getting better!
Oh, Bigfoot. Come out, come out wherever you are.